I'm going to introduce you to a friend, colleague, co-author, the honorary chairman of uh, CEPR, a Hoover Institution Senior Fellow and an outstanding American, George Pratt Schultz. George in his lifetime has held more positions of importance and responsibility than anyone I know, probably more cabinet positions than any other American in history. He's held the positions of the United States Secretary of Labor, Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary of State, and he was director, the first director of the Office of Management and Budget. He had a distinguished, uh, and is having a distinguished career in academia, and uh, also had a distinguished career in the private sector, and he was a U.S. Marine in World War II. He was awarded the Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor. Uh, George Schultz is going to moderate uh, this evening's panel, but before I turn it over to George, I will briefly introduce uh, the rest of the panelists. You have detailed uh, bios in your program. Uh, John Hennessy is the uh, 10th president of Stanford University and the Bing presidential professor. He has been a member of the faculty here at Stanford since 1977. He's received numerous awards for his research. Uh, he has published widely and is the co-author of two internationally used undergraduate and graduate textbooks in computer architecture design. Most relevant to this uh, evening's, uh, the, today's uh, conference, he is the 2012 Medal of Honor winner of the IEEE. Uh, he serves on the board of uh, uh, Cisco Systems and Google, but most importantly, he has led Stanford for 13 uh, terrific years. Steve Chu served as Secretary of Energy from 2009 to 2013. He won a Nobel Prize in 1997 for physics and receive uh, many other uh, awards. He served as the director of the Department of Energy's Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, where he worked on renewable uh, energy. He has held positions at uh, Berkeley and Stanford and AT&T Bell Labs. He is the holder of 19 patents and has published over 250 scientific and technical papers. He is the uh, currently the William Keenan Professor of Physics and Professor of Molecular and Cellular Physiology here at Stanford. And William Perry is the Michael and Barbara Berberian Professor at Stanford. He is a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. He was the nation's 19th Secretary of Defense. He also has served previously as a Deputy uh, Secretary and Undersecretary for the Defense Department. He serves on CEPR's advisory board, very importantly. Currently, he's on the board of several high-tech emerging companies, and he also was uh, awarded the Medal of Freedom in 1997, and the Knight Commander of the British Empire in 1998. He's received numerous other awards and continues to speak on foreign policy, national security, and arms control, and he's an award-winning uh, uh, teacher. So here you have Stanford's Hall of Fame all-star team. <laughs> So, George, I'm going to turn it over to you. This subject <clears throat> has a long history and a tremendous future. Looking back, I remember in 1962, I wrote a book entitled Management Organization and the Computer. And the argument of the book was you're using this thing to do payrolls and personnel records, wake up, it's going to change the way you run things. It got a terrific response. My mother bought a copy, but she didn't read it. That was it. <laughs> Subject was not popular, but it was there. 
I remember in 1985, I gave a talk to a Stanford group, I was Secretary of State at the time, in Paris, on the information age and its international implications. And Gorbachev noted it somehow. And we talked about how if you continue to run a closed and compartmented system, you would fall behind in the information age. He got it. And I think change came about in the Soviet Union, partly as a result of this insight on the part of Gorbachev. So there is a history. And what we have seen is a development in information technology and the internet and so on that has been a tremendous enabling development. Huge good things have happened. But in the process, there has been created systems. And the systems are vulnerable. So it has been interesting to me in attending this session during the day here that practically all of the discussion has been about what you do about the problems. Nobody is remembering that the reason it's here is that there's so much good stuff coming out of it. So I think we need to remember that balance as we think about the problems. One of the new things that's happened, at least in my preoccupations, is the fact that while diversity has always been present in our world, it has historically been ignored or suppressed. But now, in this new age, you can't ignore it. People everywhere know what's going on. They can organize and express themselves. So the new problem of governance is how you govern over diversity in an age of transparency. And most countries have not posed that problem to themselves. So nothing much is happening, although the problem is there. And I believe that from a governance standpoint, it's going to be with us and we will have to confront it and can be dealt with. At any rate, there are all sorts of angles to this. And we have a terrific group of uh, panelists here. So I'm going to ask each one of them to make whatever comments they choose to make. And then we'll have a little discussion. And then we'll invite some questions and have some fun. So John, what about it? All right, thank you, George. Shortly after 9-11, I was asked to join a committee talking about what the US research and response agenda should be to the new threat of international terrorism. And at the time, we judged that cybersecurity issues were actually a lower priority than issues around nuclear security or even chemical or biological weapons security. So something's changed in the more than 10 years that have transpired since that committee did their work. And I think the change will demand more international collabor collaboration and work in order to solve it. So what's changed? First of all, we've moved from that lone hacker out there, whether inside the US or somewhere around the world, who would try to break in and sabotage our information systems. And of course, in the meantime, the content and value contained in those information systems has gone up dramatically, as George alluded to. We've moved to a situation where there are now state actors that are either state supported or at least state condoned in the sense that the state knows what they're involved in and doesn't intervene in any way. That has led to a significant increase in resources, a situation where uh, very smart people are trying to sabotage our information security systems. 
sophisticated attacks, extremely sophisticated attacks uh, being launched, uh, scans done. Uh, to put it in context, there are tens of thousands of attempts to get into the university's computer systems every day. Tens of thousands of attempts. Many of those are scans looking for points of vulnerability. Some are attempts to break into individual machines. Some are phishing attempts to get an account to break in. But that's the scale of it, very large. 10,000 a day. Yeah, more, 25,000, 25,000, George. We're just, now, a little, we're just a little academic enterprise. What yeah. the 10,000, come on. Be better or worse, we're kind of the hub of Silicon Valley at the same time. So, and I think much of this is focused on industrial espionage, uh, trying to, so when they broke, when people broke into our system recently, the first thing they went to was the general counsel's office and apparently trying to break into uh, accounts which contained information about con licensing contracts between Stanford and Silicon Valley. Uh, also attempts to go after various individuals who are dissidents, um, who are here on our campus studying or students. Um, recently, we've seen some migration towards cybercrime kinds of activities. Um, the newest thing being a ransomware attack. So this is the newest fad in breaking in. You, you fish an account into somebody's account. You then use that fished uh, ID gotten either through a, uh, an application which provides you access or through their password. Then you go in and you encrypt the entire contents of their computer. The next thing you know is you get a message. If you'd like to get the contents of your computer back, send $10,000 to this account in Uzbekistan. And this is where things are moving quickly. I think the last piece of this I'll say is unfortunately, offense is cheaper and easier to invent than good defense. So we see a situation where the offensive frontier is moving faster than the defensive frontier. We respond to new break-ins, to new incidents. We try to recover, we try to build a safe wall so that won't occur again. But of course, at the same time, the individuals trying to break in are inventing new attack methods. I don't think we can solve this problem simply by saying we're going to continually increase our cybersecurity. We're going to have to get so much better international collaboration around these issues or everybody's cyber systems, everybody's information technology systems are gonna be vulnerable. That's so pretty me, sobering. Yeah. <laughs> uh, can you cheer us up, Steve? No. No. <laughs> oh, um, I will try to put even more perspective. Um, it's been known for centuries, millennia, that information is power. The Rothschilds, you know, made their fortune by getting information a day or two early. And so, so what we have is something where technology has raced ahead very, very rapidly, where most of the public, the American public, the European public, the Asian public, every, everybody, does not realize how far technology is racing ahead. There's a glimmer of this. You know, you have a cell phone, and you can recognize, you know, I can go on my cell phone, I can see where the highways are jammed or green and red and yellow. You know, how do they know that? They know that because they know where your cell phone is. They know where you are. The credit card companies know where you are. They know, you know, a spending pattern is different. They call you up and say, are you really in Europe? That's both good and bad. And so the you see glimmers of this technology, but actually it's much deeper than that glimmer. It's both, I, I, I would say it's both good and bad. It's fantastically good because, um, you know, we don't have to carry around lots of cash anymore. We have a cell phone. Uh, but it's racing ahead the regulatory framework, the appreciation of the public of how far it's racing ahead is about five to 10 years lagging. And so this is one of the issues I hope we can talk about. How do you actually get 
depreciation because these are things that, l let me go to the United States, we have to figure out, you know, how do you respect privacy, how do you respect all the benefits, and how do you respect all the things that are good with all the things that are bad. And so this is just part of it. Um, what people don't realize is, we talked about credit cards and cell phones. It goes to the electrical distribution system. Uh, five years ago, even today, you know, you, you have security because you're isolated. If you need electricity, you call up someone else and say, could you send electricity over? We actually can't do that going into the modern age. Um, Isaac Newton was a, kind of a rich guy, and there was a plague, and, and he went into the countryside. He was isolated. You do not want the electricity transmission distribution system to be isolated. This is tragic, that you have to call up, and this is what happened in San Diego. They, the, an adjacent utility company has to say, can you send electricity my way? I don't have any on a phone call. Okay, this is not good. And, and yet, when you have it, a, a computerized automated system, then you have vulnerabilities. And then you have to protect those vulnerabilities. So there's spy versus spy, which I'm sure we'll but talk about. Let me about. interrupt you. Doesn't that tell you, I mean, you're a former Secretary of Energy, that we need to create more energy where we use it? Yes. So with the, if the grid is knocked out, we're knocked out, no, not knocked out. We need that, but it's not an isolation system. It's a, it's a smart system that creates it when we use it and gives it back to the grid when we don't use it. So you still need the connectivity. Right, no. I'm just saying there are things you can do that are defensive, and this is an example. Yeah, but George, if, a, if, if, for example, a major transformer blows out here in Northern California, we're going to have to borrow power from Southern California or somewhere else. Well, fine. But nevertheless, if all you have is that transformer and you don't have some backup systems, I mean, we have backup systems at Stamper, don't we? Well, if well, something I think goes out, <laughs> come on, John. But nationally, nationally, actually, we don't have a lot of backup systems. We but have shortages. We need more. Right. But anyway, Steve, but, excuse but, me but for interrupting. Is, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to generalize. It's the connectivity yeah. of today's society <laughs> is far deeper than most people realize. And the connectivity gives us so many advantages, and it creates so many new vulnerabilities. And the whole cybersecurity issue is directly linked to the connectivity of in a traveling at the speed of light connectivity. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so, um, I, you know, I recently traveled to a foreign country where I was worried, and so I took my computer because I wanted to work. There is no way in the world I would hook that up to the internet. Why? Because I've been Secretary of Energy for four and a quarter years. I actually was in the National Nuclear Security Agency Advisory Bureau when it was first formed, and I know what one can do. It, one second connection, you can, you can, you can put a trapdoor, you can do it. One memory stick, you can do this. So it was one way. I got a Stanford loaner iPad. Stanford has, has this very wise program. You got loan the iPad, it only touches that. My computer never touches that. I want to give a talk, here's the memory stick. You put in your computer and I will step on the memory stick. And you don't read your regular email account. I would never read my email on a computer because when you're dealing with nuclear security secrets and you're dealing with all this stuff, you know that one fraction of a second memory stick or that one fraction of a second connection, they can, they can get into you and, and they can put trap doors and all this other stuff. So here's, I'm gonna stop right now with one thing. The technology is racing ahead. We don't know what to do about it, but I'm worried about another thing. There's a cyber security issue and a cyber offensive issue that John talked about. And the last thing you want is another arms race in cyberspace. 
that's the last thing you want. Yeah. Yeah. Because the offense is so much more powerful than the defense. And we are step by step going to a big times arm race where we can do this, we can do that, we can put these trap doors in, we can put this Trojan horse there, we can do all these other things. We can be like Russia did four or five years ago, they, Ukraine didn't pay their gas bill, which shut them down. You know, we shut down the, Russia shut down the entire electricity transmission distribution system until they pay their gas bill. Okay, you do not want those trap doors and those things in every country in an arms race. And this is the most important thing that, you know, we do not want this. Is there any agency pursuing this currently, Steve? <laughs> uh, well, I was Secretary of Energy. I was saying, how do we quietly tell everybody else we don't want to go there? Mm. How do you control it? Because if you le let each technical person pursue this, they're saying, we can do this, we can do this, okay? And then the offenses mount up, and then you can do the defenses. And oh, by the way, the defenses could be, we want to teach them a little lesson because, you know, we, we there's a cyber thing up called a honeypot. I don't know if you guys know this, but if you want to trap hackers or state agencies, you make a little fake thing. They think yeah. they got in, they yeah. buzz around, buzz around, and you infect them. And, you know, when I was director of a national laboratory, and again, you know, th this is not secret stuff. Um, you have to do this, and, and, and so, you know, and when the U.S. government wanted to test our systems, and they made a honeypot, we were very proud, but they buzzed around, buzzed around. <laughs> anyway, and, and they wouldn't get in. <laughs> but but this, is, this is something that's well known to the experts. Okay, and so I'm not revealing anything that I shouldn't reveal, but, but I do not want an arms race. I do not want this because it can be as bad as the nuclear race. Let me just tell you how bad it got, but many of you may not know. We had 34,000 warheads in the Soviet Union. They had 34,000 warheads in us. You took the average yield of the warheads and you divided by every man, woman, child in the Soviet Union, the United States, it was 20,000 pounds of TNT per person. It was nuts so. Okay, we may be heading for this going forward, and you do not want that. This is going to stop progress, it's going to stop everything, and you do not want that. So, so let's start a dialogue now to prevent that from happening. We don't want a replay of this nuclear thing. And, and, and oh, it's worse than that for one reason. The nuclear thing was based on mass assured destruction. You know. Okay. This is much more insidious because it can creep out you on you much more quietly. And you, it, you think, oh, you know, it's, you're not going to nuke, you know, 10 million people. And so that, because of that, it seemed, it is to my mind, at least is dangerous, and by the way, I'm not belittling nuclear security because there's a whole bunch of us who still think it's really important to get the stockpiles even smaller, but I'm just saying it's more insidious because you can justify that it's not mutually insured destruction, but in the end, you know, I don't know what's gonna happen. All I can say is the technology is racing forward and we have to start thinking about it now as a society. That's all. That's an excellent point for me to take off on. Uh, you have heard today and tonight uh, grim stories about cyber crime, about stealing intellectual property, on and on. It's bad and it's getting worse. I wanted to focus on what if we go to the ultimate catastrophe here and have a all-out cyber attack between two pure competitors. And as I think of that, because of my background, I naturally tend to compare it with the Cold War and with the possible of a nuclear exchange between two pure competitors. In the one case, what you're looking at is 
total destruction. In the other case, you're looking at total disruption. No immediate deaths, right. but total disruption, not just of the infrastructure, but social, economic, and political disrupted entirely. So it's really bad news. I would not compare it with a nuclear exchange, but it's about the next best, worst thing I can think of. So we really, I, to pick up Steve's point, we really don't want that to happen. Looking at the analogy a little farther, in the Cold War, we're looking at a nuclear attack. We really did not have any way of defending against it. The offense had a fundamental advantage. That's also true in an all-out cyber attack. The offense has a total advantage. You can scratch at the surface of trying to do things, and maybe it's a good, good idea to, to do those things, but you cannot defend against it, really. No more than you could defend against 1,000 nuclear warheads or 5,000 nuclear warheads coming at your country. Uh, the other, another comparison is we realized in the Cold War how dangerous this was, and we tried to use diplomacy. We tried to do what John called cooperation in this. Is there any way for the pure competitors facing each other, recognizing the amount of catastrophe that could be done, recognizing each side has this overwhelming offensive capability, is there any way of trying to stop the arms race before it starts? In the, in the Cold War, the arms race was well underway. As Steve said, we had almost 70,000 nuclear warheads in the two sides. And then what we were trying to do by diplomacy was bring it down. And we made some progress in that during the Cold War and more progress since then, much more progress yet to, yet to be made. So we could imagine diplomacy in this case, I believe. Uh, it would not be easy because the countries that are facing each other with this amazing capability, offensive capability, basically mistrust each other. But I would point out to you there was no great trust between the United States and the Soviet Union when the arms control started. It started because both sides recognized the danger, the extreme danger to the societies, and recognized the futility of defending against that. So we had something called deterrence, and that led to something called arms treaties. Is there something equivalent to arms treaties in this field? Can you imagine uh, the United States and Russia, or the United States and China, coming to some sort of an agreement that sets standards and principles that control what you can do and what you cannot do, and both sides agreeing to it, not because they want to be constrained, but because they want the other side to be constrained. And if you did that, if you could imagine taking that step, then you have to further imagine how would you go about verifying such an agreement. And the present internet, that's very difficult to do. So I think it leads you in the direction of heading for maybe closed systems for your most important infrastructure is your most important subsystem. I don't mean to suggest that a closed system solves the problem, but at least it puts you in a better, if you design it properly, it puts you in a better way of being able to verify compliance with agreements. So I see these two issues going together. Uh, the international agreements on what be done, done as a matter of mutual self-interest, not as a matter of uh, a favor to the other country. And then secondly, uh, perhaps, Using building a closed system to use for your most important uh, infrastructures as a way of uh, improving your ability to verify compliance with the treaty. So that, those are just a couple of thoughts of how you deal with the kind of problem. I want to take you to the ultimate catastrophe, the possibility of an all-out uh, cyber attack by two pure competitors, each of which have enormous, terrible offensive capabilities, which fundamentally cannot be defended against. So it, I think it drives you in the direction of diplomacy and international cooperation, and it drives you probably in the way of having a closed system so you can verify what you're doing. Thank you. Well, that's at least a little encouraging. On the other hand, Bill, in the case of nuclear weapons, it's not that easy for an individual to make one. But in this cyber arena, some kid who's smart can do things. And it's not necessarily the government. The government doesn't really have much control over them. So, I mean, you got all these bright kids at Stanford, John. You have control of them all. You know. <laughs>
Are they going to do what you don't want them to do? We give them your account, George. <laughs> <laughs> George, I no, think I, the, I, yeah. the, the analogy ahead, there is a nuclear terror attack, one or two yeah. bombs. I'm not think minimizing right. how, how terrible that would be, but it does not compare with the nuclear exchange during the Cold right. War. So I'm looking at the ultimate case where you have uh, powerful, pure competitors conducting an all-out attack against yeah. each other. And I don't know I, what to do about the nuclear, t about yeah. the And, and, the and I think, attack. George, you're, you, I mean, I think there is a reality here. Imagine uh, a attack strategy oh. consisting of some code to break into some set of systems can be transferred anywhere in the world right like that. So you can imagine some institution or some group developing this with a lot of support, with a big team, and then selling it to somebody who is going to use it to come after, the inst come after institutions financially or somehow extract money or other value out of it. I think this could happen easily. Could happen easily. The, um, you raise an important point. The kids with orange hair are pretty good, but I, I gotta tell you, the state institutions are actually much better. And so, uh, the um, all the governments of you know sophisticated nations uh, are sitting on much more capability and talent, and I agree with Bill, and it, I, I agree with everyone. Everyone said you know it's got to be diplomacy and treaty because you can do so much damage to each country that you have to back off, and that's the bottom line. You know, the offense is so much more powerful than the defense, so you've got to say, we can't go, look, a lot of technical people, they can be in love with the technology, they go to the policymaker and say, I can do this, I can do that, and, and for a brief instant, the policymaker say, that's cool. But there has to be humility on the policymaker's side that says, wait a minute, you think you have an edge for how long? For a year? For six months? For two years? It's going to be very equal, you know. Quite candidly, you know, history will show the Soviet Union could have been an H bomb within a year or two, and they did. This is the same with cybersecurity. Okay, you think you got an edge for a couple months? That's it. Let's uh, say that diplomacy is needed, and we're going to try to make agreements that will forego offensive actions and so on due to deterrent capabilities. But it isn't like it's only the US and the Soviet Union as in the Cold War. Podunk country over there can do the damage. So you can't just say there's Russia, there's China, there's the US or whatever. You've got to consider Bolivia or Kazakhstan or whatever. So you've got to connect, your, your net, diplomatic net has to be very wide. It's almost like it's a UN thing, although that's not like you're going to have a lot of confidence in most UN organizations, although some work pretty well. Um, so, you know, I don't want to monopolize, but I don't have full confidence in the UN diplomacy, but I would say that there's a minor <coughs> counteroffensive that countries can do mm. to say, you did this, mm. you know, we're, yeah. we're not gonna shut down your electrical system, but we're, you know, we'll put a little sting. And, <laughs> and so that's the part that I'm a little bit worried about because when do you stop the sting yeah. from becoming a, a dog bite, from becoming bigger? Because that's where I see the escalation. So but there the, is a the problem stick here, is, George. The stick is most effective if it's clear, I did this to you yeah. on oh, no. purpose. That's very don't clear. Don't worry, I can we, do more. We, we can do that. <laughs> we, we, can, we can figure that out. I think, I think the issue is it's the counterpart of Pakistan selling nuclear technology to North Korea. Right? It's some established state that has a big investment, that has technology, and then sells it to a rogue state. And what do we do about that? Because the rogue state doesn't have a large IT infrastructure. There is no retaliation that they necessarily are so worried about. And how do we deal with that issue? I, I think the only way to deal with it is to get the original state not 
to sell that technology, not to give it to some rogue state that's going to misuse it. John, let me pick up that point and notice that the analogy in the nuclear field is something called the Nuclear Suppliers Group, right. where the people who can make the technology come together and, and agree not to sell it to certain people. It, it works imperfectly, but it's a, a hell of a lot better than if we didn't have it. Absolutely. So we need something like the Nuclear Supplier Group in this area. Again, it's part of the diplomacy that has to be set up. Now, does anybody out here have anything nice you'd like to say or a question <laughs> you'd like to ask? This How about some good news? Group? <laughs> Wait a minute, we can't hear you. Let's get a microphone over there. There's one. That's called responsible disclosures. Hackers already have it. That's what we do to release cyber weapons to the, to the world responsibly right now. Yeah. Can you elaborate on what you just said? So. Uh, yeah, we were talking about there being rules and ethics, and I'm saying that they already exist. I, I help organize zero days for DEF CON, the largest hack organization in the world, and we have rules and ethics and how these are, are released to the public, but I can tell you that there are 100 guys in a basement that can deliver one of these within a month. So? Yeah, I, I, I mean, we get into this interesting dilemma of what happens if somebody knows about a vulnerability? Should they publicize it? because then everybody can begin to build defense against it? Or should it be kept quiet because the minute you publicize it, some bad actors may try to use that technology? And this is a, I, I don't think there's a simple answer to this problem. It's a very tricky issue. It, it's even worse than that. I think uh, there are some people who find vulnerabilities and they quietly tell people. And there are other people, it's a badge of honor, you know, I'm brilliant, I can do this. And, and we have many examples of one day an exposed vulnerability and all, all the security guys land on it, but that one day is too long. The one second of the memory stick into your laptop, it's done. They just infected you. Anybody okay. else anywhere around here? Are there any microphones? Here's a question. Here comes a mic. Why don't you say who you are so we know where you're coming from? Yes, thank you. Uh, Greg Austin from the East West Institute. Uh, Secretary Chu, I really enjoyed your remarks about we don't want an arms race. Uh, but in a sense, I'd like to turn that to a question to Secretary Perry. The, what would be the significance of the proposition that the Chinese government believes that the United States government has penetrated its strategic command and control of its nuclear forces through cyber methods on strategic stability between the United States and China, or a similar proposition between uh, the United States and Russia. So in a sense, it's going beyond the idea that we don't want an arms race. Uh, we really don't want strategic nuclear instability of the sort contemplated in the remarks by the former Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Cartwright, that the United States seeks the capability to disarm its nuclear missile adversaries in milliseconds. So how do you position that? So arms race is not maybe not the problem. Maybe the problem is what's happening operationally to destabilise and create insecurities with these nuclear missile forces. So, so um, let me let me start by saying there's there's that arms race, and if it's just this Russia and China, actually, I there I have enough faith they're not going to do that <laughs> to, to do something like that. But but there are other countries, smaller countries or terrorist groups, where I don't have faith. Okay. So so but but that's the point that. You can lay, if you have cyber you know, technology, you can lay these Trojan horses in systems, whether it's the nuclear missiles or the electricity and distribution system or the gas and oil pipelines or, or the air controller systems, the financial systems, 
everything. And you can, if you can lay these trap doors and say, you know, I'm really, I've had a bad hair day. <laughs> I'm going to bring down the FAA for a day. This is not good, right? There's lots of planes in the sky. So, so, so I think the capability, so the capability goes from sophisticated people and on down, and it's the arms race, the sophisticated nation, and the nation states are actually better than the kids with the orange hair, but there are some kids with orange hair that are pretty good. But in the end, you know, what do you deal with this? Because it's this crazy, democracy is the wrong word, it's uh, free for all, where, where these capabilities trickle down. And so, on the one hand, I think we can do a lot to get the defenses. As Bill said, there's some systems that are going to just have to be isolated. You know, the electricity and transmission distribution system, as our nuclear security is isolated. <laughs> and, and I, you know, at the electricity transmission distribution in the United States has to be firewall. And you've got to do a few of those things. You just cannot do that because, right. you know, and so that's, mm. that's what will happen. Bill, do you want to comment on that? Well, during the Cold War, our treaties were not only bringing down the number of weapons, but they were trying to achieve something called strategic stability, which is a point you were raising. And basically, strategic stability meant having a configuration of forces that reduced the incentive for a surprise attack. It's hard to think of an analogy in this field, but the concept would be the same. You want to reduce the incentive for the other side to launch an unprovoked attack. And the diplomacy should be focused not only on trying to keep down the numbers and the kinds, but focused on what you can do to reduce the incentive for the other side. And that's going to be less technical, I think, than it's going to be diplomatic and political. So I think it'd be interesting to put this in context. Who thinks the computer system that they're using today and tomorrow and the next day is clean, immune from, there is no attack has been launched on that system. It's perfectly secure. Anybody? Good, I'm glad, because the average time between an entry attempt when somebody breaks in and the time it's discovered is six months. And I think this is just gonna get worse. You're gonna see, as Steve alluded to, people leaving trap doors and not activating that trap door until much later. And if they compromise the core of the system, that's a, not such a hard thing to do. And so imagine now a, a ransom attack where they don't tell you that they've taken over your system for a year. And now every single backup file that's been written of your system for the last year is unreadable. You've lost all the data for a year. And then they say, oh, by the way, I need $20,000 sent to my private account somewhere. I think this is what we have to worry about. It's going to get a lot worse quickly. And we're going to have to change personal behavior. The bad news is security and ease of use don't go together. Your life is going to get more complicated. How many people use the same password for multiple accounts, bank account, personal login, all these sorts of things, we all use the same password, or at least a few passwords to get into many different accounts. That's going to be a major point of vulnerability in the future. We're going to have to adapt in ways that are going to have to force a change in how we operate. And I don't think we have an alternative here. Let me just amplify that. You know, it started as director of Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and um, and then as Secretary of Energy, I, I made a quick allusion to a memory stick, but let me reinforce that to let it sink in. Um, you get those little memory sticks. I, I recently gave a talk, computer, one way. You're going to put that in. I'm not going to hook my computer up to your system. And after that, I threw it in the trash can. Because we knew 10 years ago that one second of that memory stick could infect you and that trap door 
and your computer and your computer system and the Lawrence Berkeley lab computer system and the University of California computer system is compromised. That's it, okay? One second. It's, it's like I just coughed on you, except it's much quicker. And so that technology existed 10 years ago, as far as I knew, okay? It exists 10 years ago. So, so um, you know, uh, who is it? Andy Groves has said only the paranoid survive. You know, this, in cyber stuff, you know, be cautious. Yeah. <laughs> Out over here. Back there, George. Let me ask. Uh, way back there. Okay, way back. Here, here's a mic. Hollywood. Oh, here. Fantastic. Getting two at the same time. Uh, I would like up, to come. Speak up. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Excellent. Uh, I would like to come back to the uh, uh, arms race, this uh, cyber arms race, and I just wanted to ask uh, Secretary Schur and Secretary Perry, isn't it too late? I mean, haven't we already embarked on, on this uh, path towards a cyber arms race? The, the train has left the station. Looking at the last couple of years, I, I, would, I would make the point that we have to now start to think about how we can uh, establish something like a cyber start or a cyber assault uh, 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 process in order to limit the damage that can ultimately be caused? Yes, it's already started. Uh, that doesn't mean it can't get a lot worse. Uh, again, using the analogy of the Cold War, the first thing we did in arms control trees was just try to cap so it wouldn't go any farther. Then we started working to bring it down. It was a long process, and it was an imperfect process, but it was at least moving in the right direction. Uh, George was the uh, Secretary of State at the time, some very fundamental reductions were made in nuclear weapons. First time that had happened, as I believe. So it can be done uh, by analogy, and I think it can be done in this field as well, but it requires diplomacy very, very different than we have today. And it requires all the nations who are going to be involved in this diplomacy understanding that it's their infrastructure, their society they're trying to save, and that they can't have it both ways. They can't have, be able to save their own system without being willing to help save some other nation's system as well. So um, I agree with Bill. We are in an arms race. You know, four years ago when I became Secretary of Energy, quietly in the government said, we are in an arms race. The first thing to recognize is we are in an arms race. After you recognize we are in an arms race, then you quiet it behind the scenes, try to tamp it, slow, it, slow up the increase, and then finally have a decrease. And that's the way we have to go. Uh, i make one other point here that one of the benefits of our arms control treaties was not the treaties themselves, but the fact that it got the issues out on the table. It had the potential adversaries discussing these issues, understanding how their own nation's security was at stake and why they had to come to some kind of international agreements. Uh, I think the agreements we might come to in this field will look very different from the kind of arms control treaties we had, but the principle is the same. Both nations not trusting each other, but understanding that they don't bring this under control and start reducing it, that their own security is in deep danger. So we should say, George, there, there are things people can do. There's a question over here. Encrypt your, encrypt your cell phone. Encrypt your, all your laptops, all your tablets. Encrypt the machine on your desktop. Encrypt everything. You should do that immediately because I think the vulnerability that everybody has and the, the vast majority of machines out there are not encrypted and whether you are being snooped on by a branch of the U.S. government or by somebody else, you should encrypt it today. So by the way, uh, that's mandatory policy in the medical school. I'm, I'm, I have a primary appointment in medical school and, yeah. and a second primary appointment in physics. It's not mandatory in humanities and sciences. It's not. But, it but I had to force it in the medical school. <laughs> but it's actually, but, and it was only forced in the medical school because of patient confidentiality. Yeah, people but, lost. But you know, but I, I, would say, I would say, you know, for all the professors in the rest of the university, hey, you know, do it. But this discussion 
sort of is like we have created a monster. And all we talk about is the destructiveness of this monster. Well, maybe we should have less of the monster. No, 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 with. George, please. Okay, I on, hope I get on, that out of you. On, so on. what is, you've got to get the other side. Is there something positive here? I, I mean, look at what's happened with information technology. Anything you want to know now, you just go online and you can find out things that 20 years ago would have taken you months to figure out. But that's a terrible thing. You don't have to remember anything anymore. You can just look it up. It's good for us older people, George. You don't have to put anything together. Yeah. The older we get, the better it is to be able to look it up. I'll go back to my first comment, credit cards. How many of us want to give up our credit cards? Think about that. Yeah. We won't want to give up our credit cards, but the credit card companies know where you are. Some of, most of you have cell phones. If you the, use it, they know where you are. Uh, yeah. Well, if you don't want to use it, that's okay. Well, but cell phones, <laughs> they know. Cell phone, they know where you are to a block. <laughs> and, and so there are certain things that are fundamentally good. And quite candidly, I will say this, you know, you know as we go into the new world and, and for energy and, and climate change, we will need these tools. And we will need these tools to have managed two-way flows. We will need these tools to get a, a, Most of you know, let me go to another thing about cybersecurity. The electricity and distribution system has had, in the last, every, if you look at the last four years from 90 to 95 and going on, we have gotten many more blackouts. It, you know, the American Civil Engineering gives us a D plus because we have had so many more blackouts. It goes, actually, I, this is the only thing I have written down. 91 to 95, 41 blackouts affecting more than 50,000 people. 96 to 2000, 58 blackouts. 2001 to 2005, 92. 2005 to 2003, 49. It's rising very rapidly, the number of blackouts where more than 50,000 customers are denied service for an extended period of time. We need the infrastructure to give us the electrical reliability. That's going to depend on the cyber interconnection. Okay? And so if you don't want to live without electricity, you need that interconnectivity, but you're more vulnerable. So you've got to do both. That's you know, it's, it's complicated. That, that's one ex place where you can be defensive. Yes. That is, you can have yeah. more energy where you use it. Yeah. So you're not so vulnerable. And probably we should be thinking of counterparts of that to the extent they're available. And the panel has been positive about the idea of what amounts to deterrence and having agreements. Of course, this is between large organizations or mm. governments, mm. and how you control individuals is a little different kind of thing, but uh, there's that problem. But I don't want to have this panel end on everything a downer. That's why I put it to you, John, and you reacted like a stuck pig. Uh, <laughs> that all, these, all these good things. So let's not forget that the reason we have these problems is that there has been created something that has been immensely enabling for all kinds of good things. So we want to preserve that and at the same time protect ourselves as best we can. Well, I want to thank the panel for not being too pessimistic, for having <laughs> some good ideas and positive, but at the same time being realists, which is, you know, there are problems. So thank you very much. Thank you, George. <laughs>